One, two, three. Hi everyone, welcome to Motoko Bootcamp. Today is the first workshop, deploy your first application in 60 minutes. My name is Sebastian and I hope everyone is okay. So let's get started immediately. All right, so what's the plan for today? Uh, the first part will be a quick presentation about myself, who am I and why am I doing this workshop right now? Then we'll talk about the internet computer. So that's the, the big topic of today, the internet computer, what it is, is it a blockchain, is it a cloud, what can we do with it? Uh, after that, we'll deploy your first application, we will use the Motoko language, uh, I will guide you through all the steps and you will do it uh, by yourself. Then we will talk about DAOs, so what is a DAO and what is it about, what can we use it for, and then why you should join Motoko Bootcamp, why you should join the next bootcamp, and I will answer a few of, our, of your questions. So let's get started. I don't want to waste any time. Let's go right into it. Who am I? Uh, so my name is Sebastian, but usually you can call me Seb. And you probably already noticed I'm French uh, with my accent pretty strong. So I'm here today because two years ago, I've taken a big decision in my life, which is I've quit school because I wanted really, really hard to get into Web3 uh, and especially in the ICP ecosystem. A uh, lot of things happen and it was really good decisions. Uh, I've learned a lot and that's what I'm going to teach you today is about that. Right now I'm working at Code and State. So we are a Web3 Venture Studio and I'm education lead there. So I'm doing everything related to education, uh, boot camps, tutorials, workshops, and so on. A Venture Studio, for those of you that don't know, is a company that uh, creates other companies. So Code and State is like uh, an accelerator basically. And so the main thing I'm doing, my main thing is the Motoko Bootcamp, which is the program I'm going to talk about today. It's a bootcamp to get into Web3 and in the ICP ecosystem. And I've already helped 200 people join our ecosystem, and I'm looking forward to help you join the ecosystem as well. So uh, you can find my Twitter handle if you want to follow me on Twitter. I post a lot of updates about the bootcamps. So why should you care? Uh, everything is good. Why should you care about this workshop? So Web3 is full of opportunities. There are a lot of scams, but there are a lot of opportunities. Things are really early right now. So if you want to get involved, um, yeah, there are a lot of opportunities to make money, but also to make friends, to make connections, and to, yeah, just to build things. There are a lot of space. Even if you don't get uh, so far, if you don't like, innovate, uh, you will not get the opportunities, but you will still be impacted by Web3, whatever you do, even if you are not interested by it at the end of this workshop. The main thing is that it's going to change the world and it's going to change how we work. So this is going to impact you in any case. That's why I think it's better to get ahead and understand how everything works so you can prepare and adapt. And Web3 is also an amazing space because a lot of jobs right now, I think, are lacking purpose and people don't want to work just for money. They also want to help society. They want to help fix the problems that we have. So whether it's climate change or um, social media problems or poverty, inequalities, we have a lot of problems in the world. I am not gonna <laughs> teach you that, but yeah, essentially with Web3, I believe, and we believe as a community that we can solve s some of those problems. So that's super interesting to combine your work and also uh, something that you, you find meaningful. So I hope that's enough. Uh, and also it's pretty cool. Like if you're a nerd and you like coding, you will love this workshop. I really like to go and talk to people uh, usually that don't know anything about Web3 or crypto. I do that uh, very regularly when I go out or when I meet people and I ask them generally, uh, hey, uh, do you know crypto? Do you, do you know Web3? Have you heard about it? And 99% of the time, it's always the same answer. It's, yeah, I know crypto because I've lost money or I know crypto because I've made money or I'm going to make money with this new strategy or this new coin that I've invested in. But essentially, every time I discuss about crypto, the discussion comes back to the money, money side. And I don't blame them because actually, if you look online, that's essentially what the space is about. If you find content on YouTube, it's going to be about which crypto to invest in, how to get rich with crypto. Uh, a, few, a few days ago, the process of uh, Sam Bankman fried so the FTX exchange, uh, made a lot of noise. It was about a huge financial scandal. So essentially, there is an association for people between crypto and money, uh, cryptocurrencies. So 
people think crypto is about money. And I'll argue crypto is not about money. So crypto is about cryptography, uh, mathematics. It's a special, specific branch of mathematics that we've been using for thousands of years. Essentially, cryptography is about encryption and decryption. But I would argue that it's also about creating systems that we can trust. So, for example, um, in the 80s, cryptographers have come up with the RSA algorithm, which is used today in the banking system. And it's very useful for online uh, transfers or when you process any kind of transaction online, you use your, your card. You go through this, uh, those algorithms and that's because of those algorithms that we can create a trust system. So the banking system, for example. And the crypto industry is essentially all about this. It's about using mathematics to create systems that we can trust. And so we've already seen quite a few innovation. Uh, you probably know all of this, but I just want to make a quick introduction for the people that are very, very new to crypto. There are a lot of things happening in this industry. It's very, very big. But to make things very simple, I think there are two innovations that we can focus on um, that are very, very important. The rest is details and kind of noise. But there are two main innovations. The first one was Bitcoin in 2009. Someone uh, or a group of people, we don't really know, released the first money that was without a government. So we have monies like euros, dollars, yens. All those monies, they need a government to, to run because the governments need to manage the money supply. They need to give uh, trust behind the money that uh, the money is use useful. Bitcoin is the first money where you don't need a government behind it. So instead of trusting a government, you essentially trust the math of the protocol, the mathematics, the cryptography to make sure that uh, the money is safe and you can make transfers and so on. So that's the first step, interesting. And very smart people came up with the idea that it was not enough to just have the money. They also wanted to program the money. So they invented Ethereum with smart contracts. Smart contracts essentially enable you to program what the money is doing. And that's how you can build a financial system. So you can say, um, I will make it possible to stake the money, I will make it possible to borrow the money or lend the money. You can do more things than just transfer. You can do, um, for example, if I transfer to you, then it will be divided between two accounts and so on. So you can write scripts that will essentially um, decide how the money should behave. And with this, you can recreate a financial system. So this is a financial system, but this time we don't need banks because we have the Ethereum protocol, which is an open protocol using cryptography um, that essentially gives us enough, enough trust. And so today I'm not here to talk about Bitcoin or Ethereum. I'm here to talk about what's next, what's the next stage. And before talking about the next step, I want to look back at where crypto is right now, because um, actually we can hear sometimes that crypto is a scam, that it hasn't impacted the world. It's not... Uh, something that is real. Uh, I think it's mostly people that are uninformed because if we look behind the scenes, already a lot of people are using crypto and are adopting crypto. So of course it depends on the country. I live in Europe right now and it's very biased because in Europe we have a banking sector that is very, very developed. And so we don't really need crypto. People can pay, people can borrow money. They don't need crypto. Uh, they can use it, but they don't need it. And that's why we have this feeling, at least in Europe, and also I know that in the US, um, in North America, it's a similar situation. But in other countries, uh, especially countries with high inflation, like Nigeria, Turkey and Argentina, we have 30% more adoption rate in, crypt in crypto, which is already, uh, I mean, it's a significant part of the population. So it's already very, very uh, spread out. Finally, even though we are still early, there is something called DeFi, uh, Decentralized Finance, which has already uh, spread out. So there are a lot of startups working in DeFi. I've added one image here, which is uh, Liquity. Uh, it's a 0% interest loan uh, protocol, which is super interesting. I won't dive into it today, but essentially in Decentralized Finance, a lot of things are happening. So we are still in the early days, but we can say that disruption of finance is already happening. But are we going to stop at finance? Are we going to decentralize only finance? No, I believe we are going to decentralize everything. But to achieve that, 
I want to go back to 20 years ago when internet appeared. And I was really, really young. So I remember that the first websites and the first time I connected to the internet, it was very slow because I was using a very, very, um, like 50, 50, 56K modem that were very, very slow. Uh, it took like five minutes to download a song or something. And most of the websites were essentially just text. So Wikipedia, for example, uh, Yahoo, you can only read, you cannot really interact. And then we had around 2005 to 2006, uh, at least in France, where I used to live, we have suddenly access to broadband internet. So we have way more uh, connectivity and we have way more data that can go through uh, websites. And that's where we start to see like Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, um, MySpace, and all sorts of applications where we can not only read, but we can also interact with the website. Usually that's what we call Web2. So Web1 is only read, Web2 is read and interact. Um, and this Web2 kind of phase was only possible because we had the underlying technology uh, of the broadband internet. So now I want to talk about Web3 and the underlying technology that makes all of this possible. We've disrupted finance with crypto, but it's only the beginning. So if you look at all those industries, uh, either media or education or agriculture, all of them are centralized right now. Uh, depends on where you live, of course, but you can probably think about one or two big uh, conglomerates or corporations that essentially kind of run the whole industry. I believe we are about to see all those industries being, defied in, being, being disrupted and being decentralized in the next 10 years. But for that, we need a way to make that possible. With finance, we only need to store uh, essentially financial data. So if you look at Ethereum, Near, Avalanche, um, Solana, all sorts of blockchain, they are, some of them are fast, some of them are slow, some of them are centralized, some of them are decentralized. But all of them are essentially just uh, ledgers. So they are databases where you can uh, have rows and you have columns and you can do transfers. So you can kind of imagine them, uh, represent them as a Google spreadsheet, a big one that is decentralized and spread across the world, but it's a spreadsheet. Today, I want to talk about something different. I want to talk about a blockchain where you can store websites and applications. Full website, full application, um, completely on the blockchain. And for that, we need a new kind of underlying technology, we need a computer, we need a blockchain computer. This is called the internet computer. I didn't choose the name, so uh, it's not, <laughs> I don't fully <laughs> agree with this name, uh, but it's called the internet computer. And that's the technology that I want to talk about today. So uh, let's do a quick break and see a video that is about the internet computer and explains all of it. So what exactly is this thing called the internet computer? Well, if you look on the internet, you will find people telling you it's a scam. I mean, just look at the token price. But you might also find people that are extremely excited about the internet computer. They think it's a revolution and it's going to transform the way the internet works. If you're feeling confused right now, that's totally normal. That's why today we'll take a few minutes to understand how the technology works so you can build your own opinion. Before we start, we need to precise something because the term internet computer is used to talk about three different things. The first one is a network. The internet computer is a decentralized cloud. We'll talk a bit more about that in the next few minutes. The second one is a token. ICP is a cryptocurrency. You can buy it on exchanges and trade it like any other coin. The token has utility in the network. You can burn it to pay for computation or you can stake it to participate in the governance and earn rewards for that. Finally, ICP stands for Internet Computer Protocol, which is a program. It's actually the program that runs in the node that powers the network. The code is open source, you can find it online. It is currently researched and maintained by the Definity Foundation, but other contributors are welcome to participate. Nodes are maintained by independent data centers and they have pretty high requirements in terms of hardware. Here you can see the inside of a node, you can see the RAM and the CPU. Here you have multiple nodes that are being installed. Finally, this is what the nodes look like when they are running and powering the network. Let's review what we've seen so far. The internet computer is composed of nodes. Those nodes are connected over the internet and they communicate between each other. They all run the ICP protocol. This enables a network to exist. We call this network the internet computer. 
On top of it, we can create decentralized application using canisters. Actually, the ICP token is built into one canister, which is called the ICP ledger. The ledger is responsible for processing transactions, minting, and burning ICP tokens. The internet computer is divided into subnets. You can see five of them right now. Each subnet powers a number of canisters, and each subnet is powered by a number of nodes. At this point, we've understood that the internet computer powers canister. But what is a canister? A canister is basically a WebAssembly module. If you are not familiar with WebAssembly, there will be another video dedicated to explaining WebAssembly. But for the moment, just bear with me. Any language that compiles to WebAssembly, like Rust, Motoko, or even TypeScript, can be used to write code for canisters. Users directly interact with canisters by sending messages. Those messages can represent actions that you will take on the network, like transferring a token, minting an NFT, or even posting on social media. Canisters can also interact with other canisters by sending and receiving messages. This enables interoperability between different services. A canister can be used to create almost any kind of application. You can create a messaging app like OpenChat, a social media application like Discover, or even an NFT collection like BTC Flower, and many, many more. If you are familiar with other ecosystems like Ethereum, Solana, Avalanche, or even Near, you might be thinking that canisters and smart contracts are very similar. And this is true, they share a lot of properties. However, canisters are a completely new concept. Canisters were developed specifically for the internet computer. And they can do things that smart contracts cannot do. Let's see what they can do. Let's say that today you want to interact with a really famous decentralized application. You want to interact with Uniswap. Uniswap is powered by smart contracts and those smart contracts are hosted on the Ethereum network. So you, as a user, need to find a way to interact with the network. You will likely go on the website and download the web page. Unfortunately, the web page is not hosted on the Ethereum network. The web page is hosted on a centralized cloud server, something like Amazon Web Services, for example. Also, you will need to pay fees for the execution of the smart contract. To pay those fees, you will likely need to download a wallet, something like Metamask, for example. To download Metamask, you will likely go through a centralized store, something like the Chrome extension store. And the problem is that Metamask cannot directly talk to the Ethereum blockchain. Metamask also needs an intermediary, something like Infura, for example. The problem with all those intermediaries is that each new intermediary is a potential security breach, is a risk of censorship, and is also an entity that you have to trust. So let's see how the internet computer can solve this issue. Now, let's say that you want to interact with an application that is hosted on the internet computer. Let's say that you want to interact with Discover. The good thing about Discover is that everything is in a canister, even the website. A canister can serve a website directly to users because a canister can answer HTTP request. That's a huge improvement. It means we can get rid of the centralized cloud. Also, you don't need to pay for any computation. The canister has a cycle balance and will use its own balance to pay for computation. It's a huge improvement because we can get rid of the wallet and all the intermediaries associated with it. This is called the reverse gas model. All right, so at this point, it's possible that you think none of this is possible. None of this is true. I believe blockchains are slow. You cannot host a website on the blockchain. I don't believe you. So to prove my claims, I want to show you two applications. The first one is called Whale of Fame. Uh, it's actually the Motoko Bootcamp Whale of Fame, which is where all of the students that go through this workshop will be displayed. The second one, and I will explain a bit more, the second one is called OpenChat. And so I've created the Motoko Bootcamp group on OpenChat. Um, this is a messaging application that is completely built on the internet computer. So I can send messages. This is a demo. And it's like a WhatsApp or Messenger application, but everything is on the blockchain. And this application is actually the first application that is fully controlled by a DAO. So there is OpenShot DAO, which is able to upgrade the code for this application, <coughs> is able to uh, manage the business model of the application. So all of this is managed by, uh, by a DAO, which is super interesting. And that will be the topic of the, the next 20 minutes, uh, the, the last 20 minutes. What I, want you today to, what I want you to do today is to actually join me in this group 
And for the first five people that will join me in this group, I will send you one ICP. So I can send money with this application. Um, I will send you one ICP, which is around two or three or three dollars for the first five people to get into. How do you get into? Well, you need to get the code. To get the code, you need to deploy something on the Whale of Fame. So you need to write a message with your name and what you think about Web3 or what you think about Motoko Bootcamp. Be careful because this message will be stored forever. So you are very early right now. You probably are the first uh, in the first 100 people. Um, so take this responsibility seriously. How are you going to write this message? Well, you need to follow the instructions. So um, please look at the chat. I will send a link. And in this link, that will be the way to deploy your first application. Uh, so it's called deploy your first application. It's a GitHub repository where you have all the instructions and you need to, to go here, um, Motoko Playground, and follow the instructions. Okay, so this is an online uh, coding ID. So if you are a coder, you probably know Visual Studio Code or uh, BrainJet, all sorts of, um, of tools. This is the same, but it's online. So we don't need to install anything. We can do all the code for Motoko here. There are two files. So on the left side, you can see two files, uh, demo.mo and main.mo. Demo is going to be me writing the code and explaining what's happening. Main.mo is going to be you. You have a few tasks to complete. And once you complete the task, uh, you will be added to the Whale of Fame and you will, be, uh, you will receive the link to access the open chat group. So um, let's get started with Motoko. Um, I will explain everything that we are doing here. So this is a very simple canister. So I'm writing the code for a canister and I'm writing it in Motoko. The first thing that you will always see with um, the code for a canister in Motoko is the actor keyword. So actor is essentially based on the actor model. Um, I won't dive into it today, but it's a concept in computer science. And canisters are essentially actors. Um, then I added the name of the canister, but I could remove it. It's optional, but I wanted to give it a name. Uh, this is just a demo canister. Before explaining the code and the functions, I will actually deploy this canister. So I click here. Uh, there are some options and instructions. We don't really need to care about this at this point. Just click on install. This is going to deploy my canister on the internet computer, so on the mainnet. Usually, we should pay to do that because um, computation and storage have a cost on the internet computer, of course. But this is a playground, and this is going to deploy my canister for 20 minutes. After 20 minutes, it will be deleted, as you can see with the countdown here. And because we are only doing it for tests, we don't pay anything. When I deploy my canister, I automatically, automatically get access to a candid UI, which is essentially the interface to my canister. This is public, this is on the internet. You, you are going to be able to access it as well. And here, um, the candid UI lists all the methods that my canister uh, has publicly listed. So I have two methods, which is C message and change message. What is this canister doing? The simplest task of all of those, uh, of all of the possible tasks, the canister is just storing a message, like a piece of text, and you are able to see it or change it. So we can see it, join the Web3 revolution, and we can change it. So, hello uh, from Lisbon. You will notice that querying, so looking at the message and changing the message, um, doesn't take the same amount of time. So this is taking more time to change than to just read. I will explain why in a few seconds. Uh, and essentially, that's about it. The goal is for you to deploy a similar application uh, in main.emo. But before that, follow the, um, you need to follow what I'm doing. So I will explain how I've created this canister. Um, I've created variables and I've created functions. So in Motoko, we have two types of variable. The first one is immutable variable. And to use an immutable variable, you use the let keyword. So I will write it, let website. Then you need, for all variables declaration, and usually all declarations in Motoko are very typed. So we always need to specify the type. Uh, so types is, can be a text, can be a natural number, can be a Boolean, um, all sorts of types. 
But in Motoko, for today, we will only use the um, text the text type. So websites is a variable of type text. And that's what essentially we're saying here uh, with this operator. And I will assign it to the value of the website of Motoko Bootcamp. So this is the address. Uh, and that's about it. Every line of a variable declaration of a, or a function declaration needs to end with a semicolon. So as you can see here, I don't have a semicolon. And I have an error uh, which says that this is not expected. I need to add it at the end of the line. Immutable variables are variables that you can never change. So you said it once, the website, I said the, the value once, I can never change it. Um, I've, actually, I've actually added a little comment saying that this is commented out. So this function called change website is not part of the canister, but if I were to remove the comments and add this function, I would, um, I would see an error because it's not possible to change the website actually. You can try it out on your own. The second type of variable in Motoko is mut mut our mutable variable. Essentially, it's the same syntax. So uh, there are messages of type text and then join the web pre-revolution. The only difference is that instead of using let, we use var. And this variable can be reassigned. So we can change the, the value of message. We can change it multiple times um, as, we, as we go. Same uh, as, as with let, we need to end the, the, the declaration with a semicolon. Then we have two functions, so two variables and two functions. The first function is a function to see the message. So I'm just going to call the function and it's gonna return the message as you can see here. The second function is a function to change the message. So this function needs an argument, which is gonna be, uh, let's say, hello world this time. And then it returns nothing, but it changed the value of the message. We have two different functions. One of them is a query, the other one is an update. So this is how you define a query function in Motoko. Query functions are very fast, around 200 milliseconds, because they don't go through consensus. So like all um, blockchain or decentralized infrastructure, the internet computer has a consensus, and it takes time to change the value of your canister. Uh, that's why update, update functions take some time, because you have to go through consensus, all the nodes have to agree on the change. The query functions, you only read the value. So in a query function, I wouldn't be able to change the value of the message. I would only be able to read it. And that's why it's very fast and you don't need to, um, you don't need to, to wait for it. But it's a query and I cannot change the, the value of message. So I'm just returning the value of message. One other thing with the, the function. So uh, we have said it's a public function. Uh, which means it's accessible from the outside. I can see it from the candid interface. It's a query function, so there is a query keyword. Funk is the keyword for function. Then we have the name of the function. Then we have the arguments that you provide to the function. So in this case, there is no argument. And then this is the return value for the, this is the return value of the function. So we return a value of type text. And you will notice that all the functions that are public, they have a async, uh, async uh, text or async number in, in other case, but async something. This is because all the functions, um, if you're familiar with JavaScript is async await, you, you know that, but if you're not familiar with this concept, don't worry for today. Just remember that if you have a public function, then the argument type will be of the, of the return value will be async uh, whatever. So uh, async text in this case. For the update function, it's essentially the same syntax. The main difference is that we don't need to write public update function. We could actually, um, I believe, no, it's not, no, it doesn't work. Uh, so yeah, we don't need to write updates because by default, all, fun all functions are updates. So we only need to specify if it's a query, but if it's an update, we just write public function, name of the function again, and the parameter. This time we have one parameter, which is a new message of type text. And this time we don't return anything. So if you see here, what we're doing is actually just changing the value of the message uh, with the assignment operator. This means the value of message, which is here, is gonna be the value of new message, which is here. Um, so this is how you do that. And we don't return anything. We just end the function there. 
when you don't return anything, there is a special type, which is basically the nothing type, which is like this. So you need to, yeah, you need to have this return type as a, para as a, as a parameter in your function. And that's it. So now that you know how all of this work, you are able to go to main.emo and follow the task. If you have any question, I'll be monitoring the chat. And, um, and that's it. Yeah, good luck, everyone. See you in a few. How can you get involved? Well, every one of you that is listening to this workshop now, in the next 10 years, you will have either created, I hope if you go to this bootcamp, you will create, participated or worked for a DAO. And a DAO is a very general term uh, because a DAO can be a, actually an organization that is involved in agriculture, in science, education, investment, energy, gaming, uh, media, social network. There is a DAO for everything and there will be more, more of them as we move forward. But what is, it, what is a DAO exactly? Because I still haven't defined this term and you will find a lot of definitions online. I want to keep things very simple. A DAO is a new kind of organization. So we have nations, we have countries, um, we have political parties, we have corporation, association. Um, we, we have ways to organize ourselves as human or workers or communities. DAO is just a new tool in our toolkit. But it's a very interesting tool because it's a digital organization where people work together, they use transparent rules, and no one is in charge. So there is not a single like responsible person. It's a group of person. And they are all using blockchain technology, so smart contracts and canisters, to essentially work together um, for a common goal. So it could be like a very ambitious goal, like, for example, if we were to create a DAO for the Motoko Bootcamp, it could be to educate 1 million people about DAOs uh, and Motoko. Or it could be a very simple goal. Um, maybe the goal is to make 1,000 euros as a DAO uh, or to plant 1,000 trees. It doesn't matter. There is a DAO and there will be a DAO for almost all kinds of purposes. You can combine DAOs with a lot of innovations that we've seen in the recent years. So open source software, um, artificial intelligence, communities, tokenization. It's a mix of different concepts and there is not one uh, DAO that I can present as the ultimate like representation because there are many, many directions to explore. That's what is, it, is exciting about it. So why does DAO matter? And why is the focus of the bootcamp on DAOs? Because this is the future of work. This is how you're going to work. And it's also, in a sense, the future of uh, our humanity. So how we interact and work together. DAOs are a new tool and they are going to make opportunities accessible to, to everyone. So right now, um, if you are in some countries or if you are in some uh, group of people, you might not have access to the same opportunities. For example, in the past 10 years, all the biggest startups in the world were created, almost all of them were created in a specific place called Silicon Valley. Um, and that's where you needed to go if you wanted all the opportunities. This is not going to be the case in the future because DAOs, they are global and accessible anywhere and they offer opportunities. You can work for a DAO, you can contribute to a DAO. It doesn't matter if you live in, uh, in Europe, it doesn't matter if you live in North America, uh, in Africa, in Asia, you are able to contribute to the DAO um, or the DAO that you want. So this is super exciting because we need more opportunities. The problem with DAOs that we have today is that we have some DAOs, but they all use centralized tools. So they use Notion, maybe GitHub, Twitter, Google, Instagram. And we've seen those, those, those tools, they essentially are from the, the previous web. So the web tool, they, are, uh, they have a lot of problems, which is they extract value. They make a lot of money on top of us. They have privacy issues. And the worst of all of them is that they are not transparent. So if you are a DAO, and you use some of those tools, you are essentially depending on those companies for some part of your work. So if you post pictures or if you create code as a DAO, you are um, dependent on those, infra on those corporations. But remember that the goal of a DAO is to be transparent and completely trustless. So we need to be able to trust them 
That's why we cannot use centralized tools. And that's why we have a lot of things to build on the Ethernet computer right now, which would be decentralized and co-owned software. Uh, yes, I just want to finish with a very exciting future, I believe. So, okay, it takes some time, but this is how I see things moving in the future. So we need co-owned and transparent software, which is the software that we can build on the internet computer. And we are already seeing a lot of startups and uh, we, we are seeing a lot of entrepreneurs and developers coming together, building the software, but we have a ton of software to build. But once this transparent and co-owned software is available, DAOs will be able to really thrive. We will see more and more DAOs for all sorts of problems, fixing all sorts of problems and giving opportunities to people. And DAOs will lead to a major re reorganization of the world. So this is why I say Web3 revolution. I don't mean to go into a fight. Um, uh, I'm French, but I don't want to uh, go in the streets and uh, kill the kings. It's not the time anymore. <laughs> but I think DAOs are super interesting because we can actually change things, how things work uh, from a place that is relatively... Uh, comfortable to win. So as a coder and as a community member, you can already do a lot of things. And that's super cool. So, if you've liked this workshop and you want to know more, uh, we are starting tomorrow on Monday uh, Motoko Bootcamp, which is a one way, uh, sorry, one week program to build a DAO and get started in Web3. Will take place from November 6th to November 12th. We have a physical edition in Lisbon, but you can follow everything online, and it's completely free. So, if you want to join us, there are a few things to know. So, make sure to go to motokobootcamp.com. Then uh, register here. So choose the bootcamp, register here. You need to register for the kickoff ceremony. So it takes place tomorrow. And that's where I will explain uh, everything, like how you access the resource, what projects you need to build, and all the sessions. Essentially, you're going to build little projects every day that combined together will create a DAO. Um, and you will write all of this in Motoko. And make sure to join our Discord. So I will send the link in the chat, but we have a Discord, a Motoko Bootcamp. We have a Discord. This is where we share all the information, all the lectures. You will find the link to them. And you also find the calendar. Uh, we have some contests going on during the week. You will also find your team uh, and a few more information. So make sure this is super important to join the Discord. And for the rest, I will explain all of it during the um, during the, the the kickoff ceremony. That's that's why it's here. Um, yeah, if you want to check the calendar, go here, and you will see all the events that we have during the week. Everything that is with uh, planet emoji is online, so will be streamed and will be recorded and posted on YouTube. So if you are not able to follow all the sessions, you don't need to worry because you will be able to see the recording. Uh, and the, the sessions with a little camp are the sessions that are happening only in person. So essentially for the in-person event, we have a few more things. Uh, we will do some workout in the morning. We will also do some, some drinks uh, in the evening. But all the coding part and the building part is happening online. And you have the full calendar here. Every day we have a coding session. So that will be me coding and explaining how you create data structures on the blockchain. Um, how you do intercanister calls, all sorts of things. We will have sessions about DAO. So 
Um, I have a few guests that will come, like OpenChat will come, and also other projects will come and present what they've built. And we have the mentorship session where I'll be there for one hour and you can ask me any question. So anything from Web3 to um, like more general question about DAOs to even uh, debug debugging. So if you have a problem with your code, you can come, share your screen, and I will help you through, through the steps. So Motoko Bootcamp, register for the kickoff ceremony, oops, sorry, to, for the kickoff ceremony and be there. I will explain everything.